You can have a breakout year if you realize the new you in Christ. It's nothing you earned. It's nothing you put together. It's nothing you strategized. It's nothing that you made happen. It was all through Christ. As the new year unfolds, it presents fresh opportunities and resolutions. However, nurturing this change can be difficult when faced alone. Why not start this year on a positive note by turning to God's plan to mold you into the best you you have ever been? Here with today's message is Pastor Paul Julian. I'm not used to speaking right after a big announcement. You know, it's like, man, I don't know if I can deliver after that. It is a joy to fill this pulpit. It's a joy to teach God's Word. I I love teaching God's Word. I love seeing Christians understand how the Christian life works through God's Word. I love seeing people who have not yet trusted Christ understand grace. And we're going to talk about your breakout year. And I do believe every Christian in this room is capable of a breakout year. If you've not yet trusted Christ as your Savior, um, you also need to and can experience uh, a breakout moment and a breakout year in your life. We uh, recently had our trip, a missions trip to the Philippines, and um, I didn't mean for this to happen, but it kind of became a motto during the trip where I would, uh, before I told the group what the next day's schedule was gonna be, and it was always grueling, I would tell them it's gonna be great. And then I would explain what the agenda was. And so they kinda got used to that, and um, whenever I said it's gonna be great, they knew, get ready, it's gonna be a really tough day. And one particular day, we had just wrapped up eight schools in one day, it was really, really hot that day. A couple of the schools that we went to, there was no airflow in the covered courts. Our, Our people were, some of the young people were literally almost fainting. They were so tired, they were so hot. And it was, the next day was going to be Saturday, and it, it was a travel day, uh, not Saturday, it was Friday, but it was a travel day, and I wanted to explain to the group that we had two more schools to do before we hit the road for about a three and a half hour drive. Oh, and by the way, I was also gonna tell the group that it was checkout from the hotel day, which meant be on the bus at 6 a.m., but also get all of your luggage on the bus before we leave at 6 a.m. So this particular time, I said, I'm gonna have to do something more than just say it's gonna be great before I hit him with that. So I turned to my wife, Molly, who always has great ideas, and she said, you know what? You know those mango shakes we've been getting? Let's get the group mango shakes, give them to them when they're done at this final school, then we'll explain what tomorrow's schedule is. And I said, great idea. Great idea. So we sent one of the guys, they went and got mango shakes for everybody, and as they got on the bus, which is air conditioned, because they're exhausted and fainting, right, we handed them a mango shake. Now, timing is everything. You don't announce the next day's schedule until they've eaten and drunk about half the mango shake, right? So, after they were about halfway done with those shakes, I got up on the bus and I said, listen, I wanna explain tomorrow's schedule. It's gonna be great. And then one of them, I think it might have been Alex Johnson, figured out, is that what the mango shakes are all about, Pastor Paul? (laughs) Yeah, it was. Well, we're going to talk about a breakout year, and something that happened in the Philippines was our bus got stuck. And we have a photo. It's not a great photo, but you can kind of see. um, Anybody feel stuck in life? Spiritually feel stuck? All right, well, this is our bus in the Philippines. If you notice, it is listing a little bit to the starboard side, okay? So uh, that's the right side, by the way, okay. Uh, Buses shouldn't do that, especially on on a gravel, dirt road, all right? And so when this happened, I got off the bus. I could feel it leaning. I knew we were kind of close to that side of the ditch where it was a little bit soft. They'd had concrete trucks going up and down this road. It was totally fine as long as you stayed right in the center. And so I got off, I took one look, and I said, oh boy. I got back on the bus and I said to the group, guys, the bus is stuck, but it's gonna be great. (laughs) We then all got off the bus and 
providentially of the Lord, the guy one farm away, one, one house away, owned a big, huge backhoe and came and pulled our bus out with a piece of cable that was thinner than a pencil. <laughs> Don't ask me how it worked, but it was great, and God was amazing. The thing is, is this. There's a new you that God created, and it's designed to make you the best you you've ever been. But there's a twist. On the graphic behind me, you'll see that the you is crossed out, and that's on purpose. Because the new you that God created has a new priority, then it's not you. What do I mean by that? Well, the typical method that we follow when we talk about New Year's resolutions and uh, you know, improving our lives, and if you listen to any podcast this time of year, they're gonna say things like, um, get out of the rut, jumpstart your career, remove the micro stressors, shake your failure, kick an addiction, take control of life. You've heard them all, you've seen them all. And those aren't bad things, although some of the podcasts may not really have the right answers. But what I want to share with you this morning is that the old you method will not utilize your full potential. And in fact, the result is bondage. That's what Scripture says. The new you method, however, will maximize your potential, and the result is freedom. See, there's been a tragedy within Christianity ever since the time of the apostles. We're going to look at that today in Galatians. And the tragedy is this, it is the allowing of the law to creep into the gospel of grace and into the perfecting or the maturing of the saints. Now let me explain what I mean by law because that's not really a word that we use too much within a spiritual context anymore, but I'm hoping by the end today you'll, you'll understand this better. When I say law this morning, here's what I want you to think. I want you to think a system of self-improvement. Got it? Pretty simple a system of self-improvement. And by the way, there's a really simple word that you probably have heard, although you may not have the right definition, and it's called legalism. That is what Paul addressed in this church in Galatia. Now here's the thing. This issue of this law or system of self-improvement creeping into salvation and creeping into the maturing of saints, it's centered around two valid questions. And the questions are this, how can I feel more saved or have assurance of my salvation? You say it's by grace, you say it's by faith, you say it's all of what Christ did, but how can I know? It's a valid question. And the second one is this, I know I'm saved, I know I'm born again, I know it's all by grace, but how can I move forward spiritually? How can I be a better Christian? How can I grow in Christ? And by the way, this system of self-improvement, which is also referred to as legalism, it's a life of duty, it's a life of a point system where we earn favor with God. It's never what God intended. It manifests itself in two ways, this tragedy does. Long-time believers, people that have been saved for a long time, they miss out on true freedom and true growth. They never quite find it. And sadly, which is more my concern this morning, is new believers. Because if new believers do not understand how to keep legalism and law or this system of self-improvement out of the Christian life, they'll never understand what real growth is. Here's the problem. The law, when it is brought into salvation by grace or is brought into the maturing of the saints, here's what it's based on. It's based on the assessing of spiritual progress by external measurables. Plain English, what's it look like on the outside? Am I checking all the boxes? Am I meeting all the things that supposedly I'm supposed to do? Call it spiritual. Call it growth, call it good. All right, you have everything you need in Christ. We're gonna start with that statement and we're gonna build from there. Now here's what we're gonna do. Look in your, your handout or look in your Bible to Galatians chapter four. We're gonna take a quick peek at where we're going and then we're gonna get us there. Because when you first look at this, it's kinda of like, wait, what's he talking about? But I want you to know where we're going this morning. Galatians 4, 22, we'll look at verse 22 and we'll look at verse 31. It says this. For it is written that Abraham had two sons 
the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Now, this is pretty interesting timing of this message because of what's going on in Israel right now. And obviously you understand, if you know your uh, uh, Hebrew scriptures, your Old Testament and all, you know what story this is. Sarah and Hagar, Isaac and Ishmael. Now go to verse 31. So then, brethren, ah, here's where we take a turn because now he's talking to the believers in this church. He says, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Makes a very clear distinction who we are, what our standing is, and how we're supposed to look at life through the proper lens. Two quick things before we go backwards to get where we came, all right? You know where we're going. I'm gonna take you back so you know how we got there. But two quick things. Number one, he says brethren. These are brethren, not meaning other Jewish people. How do you know that? Because it's Galatia. It's the country of the Gauls. These are people who immigrated to, uh, to that area uh, into Greece from Ireland, Scotland, France, Wales, way before the time of Christ. These are not Jewish people. Matter of fact, the issue is, is that these are Gentiles who got saved, and then the Judaizers came from Jerusalem to tell them how to get more Jewish so that they could be sure that they were saved and they could be sure to grow. And now Paul is going to deal with the issue. So let's start all the way back in Galatians chapter two. You're with me? All right, we're gonna do this quickly so that we can get back to our main passage in Galatians four. Galatians 2.16 says this. It says that you, the new you, starts with justification. Well, what is justification? It is to be declared righteous. And when I say declared righteous, I don't mean pretty good. I don't mean you're having a pretty good day. When this says declared righteous, it means you have the same exact righteousness as God himself. That's pretty righteous. Look what it says. Knowing, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. What is the law? For today's sake, what is our definition of the law? It's that system of self-improvement. And by the way, that's not how God designed the law. That's not what the law was designed for. So what was it designed for? We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Keep reading. For, uh, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It does not accomplish what lots of people try to do with it. Jew and Gentile, okay? And by the way, the reference here to the law as we're calling it the system of self-improvement or legalism, right? Most of that had to do with the Mosaic law and, and all the things that were supposed to be kept. You see, the new you cannot even be a new you unless you are justified. How do you get the righteousness of God? Through faith, through faith. You see the verses behind me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how you're justified. That's how you're saved. You take on the righteousness of God as by faith through a free gift. Okay? No work, no law on your part was involved. How do I know that not one single part of the law was involved? Because it said in verse 16, the works of the law do not justify flesh. That's how you know. All right, keep going. The old you was crucified with Christ. Now, now look, at this, look at this verse, and then I'm gonna try to explain it here. I'm cruci Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. W wait, wait, hold on, what? He said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Well, well which is it? All right, so I don't know if this is gonna come across, but I wanna, hopefully this will work. I brought my baseball, it's my softball glove. I can't even remember the last time I put this on, so I tried it last night and it still seems to work. It's seen better days, okay? So let me illustrate it this way. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. All right, so what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna, we're gonna pretend, we're gonna use this illustrate is me, us, you, okay? What you see, right, who you are, that's this, 
okay? But there's more to us than what we see on the outside, right? We all know that. Now, before you're saved, all you had was the old man, the sin nature. You were born of your mother, born as a sinful human being, all right? So we'll let this hand represent the old nature, if I can even sort of get it on the wrong hand. All right, it's not gonna work, but it's there. It's there, it looks weird, it looks awkward, good luck trying to catch a ball, okay? This is you before you're saved. So what is Paul saying? He says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Let me walk you through it. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless yet I still live. You're still around after you get saved, but something is declared dead, that old man. So then what does he say, how do I live? Look at the rest of the verse. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Got that new man, got the Holy Spirit, now we're in business. Did anything change with this? Nope, still the old bald guy standing up in front of you. Right? It's still, it's still the same guy. Okay, and we're gonna talk through this and hopefully illustrate this, but look at the rest of the verse. But Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the new you. This man was crucified with Christ. Did he leave? Did he go away? No, unfortunately, they're fighting for the glove. That's the battle. That's the Christian life. Okay, now, let's go on. The new you has the Holy Spirit. Look in Galatians 3, 2 through 3. This is such a powerful truth. This only what I learn of you, Paul says to these people in Galatia, this only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You received the Holy Spirit when you trusted Christ. Did you do that by some work of the law? Some, some activity that God gave you? Some, some, some sort of practice, a certain song, a certain emotion. How did you get the Holy Spirit? By faith. So then look what he says. Are you so foolish, in verse three, that having begun by the Spirit, now you're gonna be made mature or made perfect by the flesh? This old flesh man, the one that was literally the reason why you couldn't hardly function in life, I mean, you could kinda of catch a ball, but it's really hard. So by faith you receive the new man with the Holy Spirit that can now accomplish things, and then you want to say that even though you got that by faith, somehow you're going to learn how to catch better and learn how to have a better life by putting the flesh guy back in there? Well, why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. If you, if you receive the Spirit by faith, it only make, makes sense that growing in Christ is accomplished outside of your power as well. You see, the new you is not about you getting better. The new you is about allowing that new man through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to take control. It's a totally different outlook than any other New Year's resolution you'll ever have. The new you, the next one, the new you is no longer under a schoolmaster. This is where it gets real. Paul gets pretty serious here. The new you is no longer under a schoolmaster. Look at verse 24 of Galatians 3. Wherefore, the law, circle the word was, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Ah, let's get back to this question, why was the law there? What's the law for? What did it do for us? It was never meant to save anyone. It was never made, it meant to justify anyone. It can't. Well then what's the purpose of the law? Friends, how would we know to what extent the righteousness of God exists without a law to declare what righteousness looks like? You see what I'm saying? You, you, you can't have a, a declaration of a benchmark, but the benchmark is not declared. There has to be a standard of what righteousness is. 
And that's exactly what Paul is saying. But he uses the word schoolmaster. Now, this is an interesting word. And, and by the way, when you look at the benchmark of Christ's perfection, how close do you think you can get? Within a million miles? Within 10 million miles? Now, nobody can do it, but let's just say you got within 10 inches. You're still short. You're still short, okay? So, but here's what's interesting. He uses this terminology, schoolmaster. When you look that up in the original language, it is the Greek, it comes from the Greek word pedagogue. Pedagogue. You know what that was? Back in that time, ancient Rome, ancient Greek, and this, this kind of went into some of the wealthier families in Israel as well. When someone was raising their child, and especially when it was going to be uh, the eldest son or the heir to the, the family's uh, fortune, uh, uh, the, at, the, at a young age, it was usually a servant or a slave hired by the family that would, in a sense, it would raise the child from, you know, infant you know, right out of that nursery age, say three years old, two years old, until they were declared ready to be a mature person that could learn and would make proper decisions. So when you see the word schoolmaster, it's not just him saying that the law taught us something. It did. But he's referencing a reality within the culture of that day, especially to these people, where there is this person who is hired by the father to get this little one ready to become the heir. And you're gonna see that in a couple of verses later, okay? So they, they didn't teach, they weren't the teacher, they did a lot of teaching. They would be the one that would take him to school, take him to the tutor. It was this person that was responsible to the father to say, you better get my son or my daughter ready to make good decisions and get them mature, get the rebellion out of them. Wouldn't that be nice? You just hand them off and then they come back a few years later all ready to go. That's kind of what happens at Quentin Road Christian Preschool here, by the way. Those teachers do an amazing job uh, with, with those kids. Okay, so here's what's interesting. And Paul's gonna talk about this. It is a servant or a slave hired or bought for this service who is now the boss over this heir to the family inheritance. Who's in charge of who? The one that is a slave or a servant is literally in charge over, lording over, telling him what to do. Keep that in your mind as we keep going here. And by the way, by the way, this, this schoolmaster, this, this pedagogue, this, this reference that Paul's making, how do, we, how do we come to that reality of what the law, what the benchmark is? How, what do we do when we get there? We realize the righteousness of Christ, we realize that we're way, 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 way short, what do we do? Oh, this is where Christ comes in. This is where grace, grace steps in. You see, because he provided a substitute, and what does the scripture say about Jesus? Born under the law, and he fulfilled the law, and then turns around and gives us salvation. What he met, he turns around and gives to us. That's grace. Keep going. The new you belongs to a new family. The new you belongs to a new family, Galatians 3.29. If ye be Christ, if ye be Christ, that's a, that's a qualifying statement that's very, very important. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, by faith, 100%, you're, you're, you, you can't lift your little finger to save yourself, right? You stand before the Lord, what am I, what, how, why should I let you into heaven? All by God's grace, I accepted what he did for me. Then that means that you're in Christ. What does it mean if you're in Christ? Look what it says. Then ye are, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is a big deal because in Ephesians it says you're the children of wrath. What changed? What happened? Keep going. Verse four, uh, chapter four, Galatians four, one through three. He, he, he finishes what he's talking about with this child under the schoolmaster. Look what it says. Now I say, 
that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. What's he talking about? He's talking about that child that is under the schoolmaster. He is literally heir to the family's fortune, but while he is a child, he is under, he is subservient to the slave himself. Yet he's heir to everything. So Paul says, don't you know that once he's a child, while he's a child, he, he differs nothing from the servant, though he be Lord of all. Verse two, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The father decides, is he ready? Okay, even so we, he says, we were children. We were in bondage under the elements of the world. He's saying to these Christians, listen, that was us. We were just like that child under the law, under the schoolmaster, bringing us to that point of reality that we can't make it. We can't, we can't meet up to the perfection of Christ. And so is it, is it, is it impossible then? Do, do we just walk away in tears? No, we say thank you Lord for your grace because he met the law. He met the perfect criteria and then offers it to us. Grace is our answer. Oh, but it gets better. The new you is an adopted child of God. Look in verse four and five, Galatians four. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And I'm not gonna spend all the time, but he's, he just says this right after he explained this schoolmaster, this pedagogue, this, this, this concept that they knew, right? Well, what was the fullness of time? When Mary gave birth, right? When, what was the fullness of time? When God the Father said it was time for the Son to come. All oh, the, 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 the imagery and the types of Christ here are unbelievable. We're not gonna spend time on that today. Keep reading. If, he sent, if God sent forth his Son made of a woman, that means he was made under the law. But he was born of a virgin, so therefore he did not carry with the sin. Verse five. To what? To redeem them that were under the law that, meet, that we might receive the adoption of the sons. Do you see what he did? Do you see what he offers you? You were under the law, I was under the law, and we could not meet the benchmark. What's the benchmark? Absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. So what did we need? We needed someone who would be Perfect, sinless, holy, yet one of us. The God-man. Oh, what a picture. Christ fulfilled all of the law and then offers it to us. So then wouldn't it be strange for us, now that we are saved, wouldn't it be strange to be like that child living under the law, being taught by the law that we could never make it, wouldn't it be strange to stay that way? Wouldn't it be odd? Wouldn't it be backwards? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be counterproductive in our lives to stay in that place? The new you is no longer under the law. What did we say for sake of example today the law means? A system of self-improvement. Galatians 4, verse 9. But now, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you go back to these things that don't save you, that don't help you grow? Why would you go back to that and try to make it something it's not? You're no longer under the law. Now, most of you know, um, every, uh, uh, every religion, every denomination, everybody has rituals, everybody has traditions, everybody has things that they do or don't do. Sadly, a lot of those have become determined that they are what get you to heaven or what keep you saved, when in fact, most of them don't accomplish anything. Hate to say it. And by the way, before we're too easy on ourselves, us Baptists, we fall into this sometimes too. Sometimes we, we, we make things uh, uh, external when they shouldn't be. And by the way, there, there needs to be an outward showing of dedication, there absolutely does. And, and we're going to, to, uh, to talk about that 
in great detail next week. You don't want to miss next week. If you're going to miss one, um, uh, don't miss next week, okay? Uh, because it's, it's, it's very important follow-up with this. But you're here today, so let's finish this one. Our old nature, our old nature is naturally inclined towards outward, external, law-based Christian living. Our old nature has a tendency to want that. Why? Because we're involved. We did something, right? Whereas in reality, what it's supposed to be is Christ in us, okay? Christ in us. You're no longer under the law. Now, if, if uh, by the way, and in, in sometimes in Baptist churches, here's how I know when, when this is off. The way I know this is off amongst Christians who have been saved for a long time is when they start comparing themselves to each other. And they, start, and they start looking down their noses at each other. Well, I'm more dedicated, or I did this, or I gave more time, or I gave more money, or I did. That's how you know it's all about the external, when that comparison thing starts to happen. Not good. Not good. Again, we're going to develop that more next week. So, if we allow that new man, if we allow that new man to, to have control, Right, we're gonna be a lot more productive. Now I wanna illustrate this, and it's probably not smart, but I've asked my brother to help me out. And it's really simple, Mark. All I need you to do, wait, stand up, stand up. I'm just gonna roll it so we don't have any issues happen. Okay, so I just need you to throw me the ball. I brought my softball mitt today because it's a bigger target, you know what I mean? All right, now listen, don't balk at this. Don't balk at this, okay? Um, Nobody caught it. All right. Uh, also, don't Derek Jeter it, okay? Don't send it like when we were kids into the bushes. All right. Jeff, where's Jeff? Jeff, are you here? Jeff, he may need some assistance. I don't know where Jeff is. He's one of our ushers, I think, today. So, uh, all right. It doesn't need to pop. We're not, we're not, it's not a double play. It's just an example, okay? Put it, put it right there. Put it right there. Oh, gee whiz. Man. Okay. Holy cow. I almost dropped it as right, because easy, Tiger. Okay. So, see, when we were kids, I'm five years older, okay? I know you probably can't really tell that, but I, I had to teach him all these things. Well, me and my dad had to teach him all these things, you know? And he always wanted to zing them, and then we're digging them in the bushes, their balls in the grass, you know? All right. Try to do that under the power of the wrong hand, right? I'm probably going to eat that in the teeth. Jeez, Mark. All right. So, doing that, functioning in Christ under the law, under you trying to improve yourself, not only does it not work, not only does Scripture declare that it doesn't work, Okay, it will be frustrating. Look at Galatians 4, 21. Paul kind of brings this whole thing to a conclusion, and now we're going to start to get back to where we started. 4, 21 says this. Tell me that ye desire to be under the law. And it's kind of a little bit sarcastic. Like, really? Really? So you're telling me you want to try to catch that ball with the wrong hand in the glove? Really? And he says, do you hear the law? Do you hear what the law requires of you? Have you not understood what the law expects of you? By the way, if you choose the path of the law in salvation or in service, here's what it requires. 100% compliance. You say, well, I mean, not everyone's perfect. Well, if you choose that path, that's how you have to live. 100% perfect. Well, then you say, well, now grace is surely looking good. And boy, is it ever, because I can't do it. But the same is how we live for Christ, okay? You have to decide, are you going to live the Christian life under the law or under grace? And so now let's go back to this story. Galatians chapter 4, Paul actually says, you're going to see it in just a minute, he actually says he's giving this in the form of an allegory, all right? So we have to be careful that we don't make it something it's not. But it's a story of promise versus self, flesh versus spirit. He says all these things to these believers in, in, in Galatians, and then he gives this allegory of this story. Sarah, 
and Abraham, right? And by the way, you all know the story, but I'll give you a quick little snapshot, right? He, he says to Abraham, by faith, I'm gonna make you a great nation, follow me, do this, Abraham does it, and then the next thing you know, he's 90, his wife is 100, and they still don't have children. And so the, the, the decision is as well, take the, the servant Hagar. Maybe, maybe that's what God intended, right? And God did not. And so then Ishmael is born. I won't go into all the details. You can read it in Genesis 16 where it, it describes him as a wild man, right? Because he was, he was, he was always enraged with other people. He, was, he didn't get along. And, 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 then, and then Isaac comes along and, and it gets even worse. And eventually Hagar is sent away. And so we see that the, the, the spirit life or the promised way of living cannot coexist with the flesh way of living or the law way of living. And let's pick it up in verse 22 of Galatians 4. I'll kind of explain it as we go. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. You know who those, people, who those women are. Verse 23, but he, was, he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. See, here's the thing about the Christian life that I can't explain. I know it's real. I'm not saying I like it, but I know it's real, and I want you to be convinced that it's real. God's word has promises that take time. They take time. You say, well, how long? Well, you're gonna be a great nation. Well, was that when I'm 75? No. You're gonna be a great nation. Was it when I'm 85? No. We're gonna wait till you're 90 and 100. How about that? Right? You say, well, why does God work that way? I don't know why, I just know the outcome. The outcome is he gets the credit. The outcome is he gets the glory. He gets to be the one to say, I did that, because we stand and we go, I did nothing. I was just standing here waiting for God to make good on his promise, and sure enough, he did. That's how he works. Keep reading. Verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar or Hagar, and for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now again, this is an allegory. This does not mean that all those that were born of the lineage of Ishmael are cursed, and, and, and they can't be saved, or they, or they can't uh, partake in this promise. Listen, every person can be saved. Every person can find and, and, and partake of the grace of God. What is this talking about? Well, see, in Mount Sinai, that was where, before they got to the promised land, that was where they decided on their own, well, God isn't acting, so we need to make this happen. And sure enough, they had a child, but the child wasn't of the promise. It wasn't the way God said. This is what people do. They try to come to God their own way. And then sometimes, when even after they figure out that they come to God, that you can't come to God your own way, you come to God by grace, then you want to perfect or mature or grow in Christ your own way. It doesn't work. That's what Paul's saying here, okay? And so, He's saying, by the way you do it, by the law, right, that's the, that's, the, that's the actual Jerusalem location. That's where you're gonna have to answer for all that. We're not a part of that. We're a part of the Jerusalem that's above. We're a part of the grace of God. We're a part of the promise. We did nothing for our salvation. We only submit to his will for our, our, our sanctification as we grow. It's all him, it's all his power, it's all his grace, and it's all of us trusting in his promises. That's it. That's how it works. Keep reading. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Verse 26, it's free. The Jerusalem of above is free. Well, how do I get there? How do I earn it? How do I make myself better? You can't. You'll never meet perfection. So it has to be a free gift. It has to be a free gift, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, for it is written, rejoice, thou barren, Thou that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And this, you go, whoa, what is he talking about? All right, I'm gonna really oversimplify it for time, but you do need to understand this is coming from Isaiah 54, and what this is talking about is this. There were a lot more people born unto Ishmael 
than unto Sarah, especially at that time. Can I tell you something? There are way more people in this world who are convinced they have to do something for their salvation. There are way more Christians in this world that are convinced that they have to do a certain checklist to stay saved or stay godly when in fact the truth is it's all promise, it's all grace, it's a matter of us submitting to what God wants to do in our lives. And so he is declaring, listen, don't don't be discouraged. Take heart. There will always be more people who are convinced they need to do something about this just like Abraham and Sarah decided, we'll fix this, we'll do it our way, and God said, no, 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 no. You do it my way. My way is supernatural, my way is through grace, my way is gonna require faith. That's how it works. And so he keeps going in verse 28, now now we brethren as Isaac, this is what I love, if you're saved, if you're a child of God, this is the category you're in. Now we brethren as Isaac, was as the children of promise, put in the word grace there, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. We saw the the fights, we saw the, the, the conflict, right, between the two. Nevertheless, what does scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then brethren, he brings it all together, we are not the children of bondwoman, the old you, That old man trying to go by the law, right? But we are of the free. We're of the new man, the new you. How does this allegory apply to new believers, New Testament believers of any, uh, however long you've been saved? You see, the thing is, is this. Grace and law, the old man and the new man, they will never get along. They, They do not like to coexist. And if you've trusted Christ as your savior and you sense that battle within, guess what? It's real. And the Bible talks about it and the Bible addresses it. And you can find victory in Christ by putting that new man in control. Oh, that old one's gonna fight. He's gonna do everything he can and sometimes he's gonna win the day, he's gonna grab the glove and he's gonna take over uh, when we have a a bad, bad stretch or a bad day. But it doesn't change anything with regards to your salvation. The law and the flesh will always persecute trusting grace. The law and the flesh will always per- persecute trusting grace. Why? Because the devil and your old man hate trusting in God alone for salvation and for service, both. They hate it. Rest in the freedom of the fulfilled promise. Rest in it. You say, well, aren't we supposed to be busy for Christ? Yes, we're gonna talk about that next week. But is it to attain something? Is it for me to make something happen? No. All that would be is me putting some polish, maybe some oil, maybe some new straps. That's just me working on this. Not gonna get you anywhere. You gotta let that new man, that new you, take over, have control. It talks about this freedom, and we're gonna end with this. It talks about this freedom. And I want you to understand this because the worst mistake you can make, sadly, a lot of Christians have the wrong idea of what legalism is. They think legalism is uh, a a church or a growth in Christ, a discipleship program or whatever it is that's based on um, rules or guidelines and that you shouldn't have uh, a a church or, or godly leaders tell you how to live. Okay, that's not legalism. Legalism is when a a church or a pastor or whatever tells you a checkbox and that's how you gain your spirituality. That's legalism. Okay, two totally different things. So the worst reaction uh, you can have towards legalism is to say, well then, no guidelines matter. We we, we can live however we we want to live. Look at Galatians, your next verse, Galatians chapter five, verses 13 through 14. Paul was asked this question several times, by the way. If we've got grace, should we just live however we wanna live? Right, he would always say, God forbid. But look at verse 13 of chapter five. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. You're not under the bondage, you're under liberty. Why, live how we want? Free to sin, no consequences, does it matter? Look what he says. You've been called into liberty. Only, only he says, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. It's like, oh, here we go. Here we go. What are we, what are we supposed to do? How, how's, this, how's this liberty, what keeps this liberty in check, right? It's the love of others. 
that keeps the liberty in Christ where it should be. It is not a liberty to sin. It's not a liberty to live however you want to live, right? But it puts the service in the right place. You were given this precious gift of liberty and freedom. You're not of Hagar. You're not of Ishmael, as the allegory says. So then what's it for? It's to love each other, to serve one another, to care about one another. This is what it's all about. Verse 14, for the law is fulfilled in one word, that thou shalt love thy neighbor. Does it stop there? Mm -mm. Mm Mm-mm. You know why it doesn't stop there? Because God knows us. If he leaves definitions up to us, we will define this a little bit differently. Love my neighbor. If I finish the sentence, it would be love my neighbor unless he does that. This says, love your neighbor as yourself. Man, I hate it when God is so specific. I gotta love my neighbor as myself? That's the liberty you were given in Christ. You see, as I serve and as I work every day to try to please God, I'm no longer worried about am I meeting the mark? Am I gaining that perfection? Am I hitting the benchmark? I can't, Christ did. Why did he? so that I could go serve, so that I could love other people the way I love myself. Man, I tell you what, if you've got that figured out, tell me how to do it, I'm working on it. It is not easy, because man, we love ourselves. We always watch out for self. We always make sure that self is happy, and when someone steps on self's toes, self gets upset, right? Love one another, love thy neighbor as thyself, at Quentin Road, I, I, I believe we try to do this. We, we try not to encourage people to serve or give or live out of guilt or fear or comparison. I'm not saying we do that perfect all the time because sometimes we get really zealous in our good works and we can sometimes make someone feel who doesn't quite get it feel like they're falling short. And we don't wanna do that. But I would much rather be in a church. I would much rather be in a church where the general sense of peer pressure is to serve and to be holy, and to give. But we do it because he deserves our worship. We do it because he's worthy, and we do it because he is holy. Galatians 5, 16, it says, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. You see, this is the system of spirit improvement. This is not the system of self-improvement, because you can do whatever you want to that glove, and it's still that old glove. But if you let the Spirit of God through the new man control you, control you, look what's going to happen. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth after the Spirit, that's that old man, that, that flesh nature against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And they're contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that ye would. This is the battle. But friends, you can have a breakout year if you realize the new you in Christ. It's nothing you earned, it's nothing you put together, it's nothing you strategized, it's nothing that, that, that you, you made happen. It was all through Christ. The new you has a new man, a new life, a new direction. The priority is not working on this thing. The priority is getting this to allow Christ control. That new man. We're gonna end with this verse, Galatians 6, 15. Galatians 6, 15 says this. For in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. What is Paul talking about, and why would he bring that up? Well, it's the Mosaic law of all the dietary restrictions and the feasts and all these things. And again, we saw earlier that God did not give them the law to save them. Well, then why is Paul saying this? He's saying, listen, All of those things that were part of the law that you thought were going to improve self, he says, whether you do them or you don't do them, he's saying at this point, it doesn't matter. And and those are strong words to be said in, in, in his time, okay? But they apply today. They apply today. We tend to add layers to salvation because it helps self feel better. We also tend to add layers to the Christian life because it helps self feel better. But in fact, he says that none of what you do or don't do is a part of that. It's all about this new creature having control. 
You get the picture. It's so important. The new you can have a breakout year from the bondage of the system of self-improvement, but it is not done through the law. It is done through grace. What does the liberty to serve others look like? Well, next week, we're going to talk about the fact that the Bible calls us priests. If you're a child of God, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, it says, actually, it says that you are of a royal priesthood. Every single one of you that have trusted Christ as your Savior, you're a child of God, you are a priest. Now we're going to talk about service. Now we're going to talk about how we worship, how we sacrifice, and how does that fit in. But before we close this morning, I want to make sure if you are not a child of God, or you haven't put your full trust in Jesus Christ, I would, I would love for you to do that today. And since I've been using um, the illustration of my hand and the glove and the new nature and the old nature, um, we'll continue that, that theme, okay? Let this represent me and you, and let my wallet represent sin. I don't think I have to convince any of us this morning that we have sin. Not only are we born into sin in this world uh, because our parents were sinners, but we then sin on our own, and the story keeps going. But we also saw today that if you're going to say, well, how do I get rid of this? I'm going to choose the way where I'm involved in some way. Point zero 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 one percent that's all I need, I'll let God do the rest, you're gonna fall short. Because you have to have 100% meeting the law to remove this and you couldn't do it. But look at the verse up here. This is so, so powerful because we needed a savior. We, we know that, we just celebrated Christmas, but what did he do? What did he do for us? This is really important. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. So let this hand represent Jesus. Again, notice no sin and we have sin. What did God do? He sent his son, remember what, the verse that we read, it said that he was born, what? Under the law. He was born of a woman who was a sinner right, but yet he was perfect. He sent Jesus, right, to die for our sins, and then it says, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wait, wait, how do we get from part A to part B? Jesus sent his son, whoever believes has eternal life. This is what it looks like, illustrated. Jesus, who knew no sin, came from the Father, took on our sin, he was born under the law, he met every single criteria and paid that sin debt for us. So the believing comes in by believing that he did that for you. That's how you have salvation. That's how you have eternal life. You say, but I mean, I gotta do something. I gotta, I gotta play some kind of a part in that. Okay, you want that path, that's the path of the law. And by the way, have you heard what the law says? 100%. Compliance has to be 100%. Well, I, I, I can't do that. Me either. That's why he came and did it for me. Right? Jesus paid that sin debt 100%. Met the requirement 100%. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we close? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to give you an opportunity this morning to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a big uh, flash of light. It's not a big, huge emotional experience, although it's a wonderful experience. But if you have never put 100% trust, realizing that I can't meet what the law requires, but thankfully the law told me what the requirement was, and Jesus met it. I'm putting my trust and faith in what Jesus did. If you're doing that this morning, I want to be able to pray for you. It would encourage me, and I also want to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and put it down real quick? Is there anybody this morning uh, that, that, that has put their faith in Jesus Christ this morning for the first time? I may have missed a hand, and, and, and you don't have to raise your hand to be saved. That's, 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 that would be works for salvation, right? It's just faith. Christians, if you're here today, I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Live in grace. Live according to the promise. And let's do it through the power of Christ in this new year. Father, we, we come to you grateful for your grace, grateful for the power of your, your word and, and, and the truths, of how we can live these truths out every day. Lord, be with all of us as we attempt to serve you and, and, and live holy lives, uh, that we would do it, Lord, with the, with the right heart, with the right purpose for a great and holy God. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.